Welcome friends as I share with you the Word of God today and particularly look at the subject of putting God first. I trust that the Spirit of God is going to stir your thinking and move your heart to be able to consider how you live and whether it reflects the things that God really wants of each of us as we serve and worship Him. Now this message is part of the overall theme for this year 2021 which is the year of action and that of course is anchored in our overarching verse through this year out of Daniel chapter 11 verse 32. The people who know their God will be strong and do exploits. So I'm going to open up with you a number of thoughts that come out of the prescribed readings for today and we're going to start with the psalm. The psalm set down for today is a psalm by King David and it's Psalm 26. As we dive into this I'm going to begin to open it up and look at the issues of how David and then others in the Bible put God first in their life and see how that reflects on the way we live and how we put God first in our lives as well. So let's look at Psalm 26. David says, Vindicate me, Lord, for I have led a blameless life. I have trusted in the Lord and have not faltered. Test me, Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind, for I have always been mindful of your unfailing love and have lived in reliance on your faithfulness. So here's King David making a pretty bold declaration of his heart toward God and of the fact that he basically is living for God. He's putting God first in his life and he makes that great declaration. As I consider how many of the Christian people in our world today, Western Christians I'm thinking of in particular, how they live, I imagine they might write that psalm somewhat differently. Let me suggest that this might reflect the way that many of your Christian friends live. Let's look at this thought. Lord, I have led a selfish life. I have trusted in my wits. Don't test me, Lord, or try me, or I will be ashamed of what is in my heart and mind. For I forget your unfailing love and have lived relying on my own resources. <laughs> now, now, that's a probably how many Christian people live today. And when God comes along with a test or a trial, circumstances become difficult. Well, instead of saying, I trust you, Lord, you've got everything under control. You know my heart of unfailing love to you. I'm going to live and do what you want me to do, no matter who says what or what happens around me. Instead, they panic and they run and they, they do everything in their power and they kind of get angry at God. God, why haven't you rescued me? So David's example of living for God or putting God first, while we read it maybe as poetry and think, oh, that's a lovely psalm, it's actually speaking to our hearts and challenging us as to whether we live the way David did and then ask ourselves the question, how can we live that way if we are not living that way now? So let's continue reading through Psalm 26. We're going to pick it up in verse 4. I do not sit with the deceitful, nor do I associate with hypocrites. I abhor the assembly of evildoers and refuse to sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go about your altar, Lord, proclaiming aloud your praise and telling of all your wonderful deeds. Great. What a great example of someone who was really totally committed to God. And we see that in the life of David. He wanted the, the Ark of the Covenant brought into Jerusalem. He, he spent time worshipping and praising God. He actually appointed new kinds of people to praise God and invented new kinds of musical instruments to offer praise to God. His heart truly was after God. And that's why uh, God had said to Samuel, I've chosen someone who has a heart after God. And David was that person. And David becomes an example for us. Not of some unattainable standard, but of an inspiration for us to follow and to move in his direction. So let's continue with Psalm 26. This is now, uh, we're going to look at verses 8, 12, 11, and 12. Lord, I love the house where you live, the place where your glory dwells. I lead a blameless life. Deliver me and be merciful to me. In the great congregation, I will praise the Lord. Now I'm going to get cheeky again and reflect what maybe many Christians who you know, many Western Christians that have been quite secularized in their thinking, how they might write those verses. I think they might find themselves saying something like this if they were telling the truth. Lord, I love the house where I live. 
where my family and possessions are. I pursue a happy life. In the great places of entertainment, I will please myself. You see, David's heart was for the courts of the Lord. And many Christians today, their heart is for, where's the fun? Where's the entertainment? Where can I go and see that latest movie? Where can I catch up with the latest new gizmo game or entertainment or distraction? Their hearts are not pursuing God, but pursuing this life and all the things that they think it offers them. Now, that's not to say we can't enjoy this life, because we find down through the scripture that God blessed his people with wealth, with, with beauty, with strength, with, with honor, um, with so many privileges. And so God is not against us enjoying this life. So how do we live this life and put God first? How can we be like David? And while we live in a world where, particularly in the West, we are spoiled and indulged in so many ways. So as I talk to you about putting God first, let me maybe take you to some Bible verses that establish that that is meant to be our priority. Let's see it from the mouth of Jesus. This is in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. He says, seek first the kingdom of God. <laughs> you can't get it much simpler than that, can you? Seek first God's kingdom. So with all the other things around us, all the things that we could enjoy or be distracted with, our heart is first to be seeking God's kingdom. And David did that too. Look, David had all kinds of treats and pleasures. He was wealthy. He was powerful. He was uh, honored. He had great significance globally. He had great significance. He had a stack of wives. He had all the sorts of things that people might think would make for a pleasurable life. But he sought God first. He put God first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And Jesus said, all the other things will be added to you if you will put God first. That lines up with what Jesus said about the first and the great commandment. Of course, you know what that is, but let's see it in the word of God. In the book of Mark, chapter 12, verses 29 and 30, Jesus said, the first great commandment is that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Wow, that uh, almost in our minds becomes like a contradiction. And this is where we struggle because we, we have this sense of um, a dichotomy. That's two different things that are sort of competing with each other. God and his kingdom and living first for his kingdom and this world and living in this world with its, all of its distractions. How to, to manage the balance of those two things? Because the Bible does say that we are in the world, but we are not of the world. Now, one way that people have tackled that is to, to separate themselves from the world to kind of put themselves in a monastery, put themselves in some faraway place, away from pretty girls, away from money, away from power, away from food that might tempt them. You know, trying to keep themselves right with God by keeping themselves away from temptations or distractions. And one of the great examples that you may not have heard of is Simon Stylites. Now, Simon was a man who uh, actually erected a, a, a pillar, a stylite, and, and he, he sat on the top of it for some 37 years. And he died at the age of 68. That was back in 459 AD. And this was his way uh, in uh, Syria, near Aleppo, to separate himself from the world. He was going to be in the world, but not of the world, uh, by actually keeping a distance away from himself. He became a saint in the, the eyes of the church. And people revered that. And many people even copied that. And I guess to some extent, the, the idea of monasteries, cloisters, people keeping themselves away from the world and worldly temptations was seen as a, a follow on from that kind of example from Simon. But that's not how God wants us to live. You see, when we think of that phrase being in the world, but not of the world, Simon basically put himself out of the world. You know, he was out of this world. He was up a pole. <laughs> he was distant. Whereas we as Christians are to put God first while living in the world. And that becomes our challenge. That becomes the thing that God is calling of us to do. And God is ready to bless us and strengthen us as we do that. You see, we are meant to have God first in our lives, in our ordinary lives. And 
the great Bible heroes, as you think of them in the scripture, you know, Gideon and Samson and David and Solomon and all the people that did great things like Moses, they actually lived remarkably ordinary lives just about all the time. They weren't walking around in some kind of spiritual cloud, uh, untouched by the real world. They got hungry. Their feet got sore. Their, their underarm got smelly. They had to go to the toilet. I mean, these were people doing all the ordinary things of life. They weren't somehow like a ghost spirit floating on a cloud. They were ordinary people like you and me. We discussed that last week about how Isaiah was a man, uh, sorry, Elijah was a man with like passions as us, just like one of us, ordinary people. So they confronted all of those ordinary things. Their lives were filled with things like eating and sleeping and working and washing and traveling and gardening and shopping and studying and doing business and raising children and caring for others and worshiping and dealing with issues and solving problems. You see, God was first in their life, but they were in the world and they were surrounded by all the ordinary things that surround you and me. And so you and I, living in this world with all those ordinary things around us, can still live with God first in our lives. It's a situation where God gets the highest priority. God gets the first call on our time, on our energies. What is that? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. God gets first call on those things. When God wants our heart, our mind, our soul, or our strength, He gets the first call, not someone or something else. And that's how we then put God first in our ordinary lives. Now, I've got a phrase for you that I'm going to repeat a number of times. I think it summarizes what the Spirit of God is speaking in my heart about, which I want to transmit to you. And that is that human existence is for heavenly purpose. Let me say that again. Human existence is for heavenly purpose. God's purposes come first. And that's how it is that we put God first in our lives. That's how we live for God. That we see that our human existence is for heavenly purposes. And so instead of saying, oh, I'm alive now and I like food, my life is about food. Oh, I'm alive now and, and I like uh, games and pleasure, my life is about games and pleasure. Oh, I'm alive now and I like sport, my life is about sport. You see, we have a human existence, but it's not about us and what we like. The human existence, as we grow up and discover that we've grown in God's garden, we say, God, you're the gardener. Why did you plant me here? What is your heavenly purpose? And then we put God first. Meanwhile, we've got to wash our hands, we've got to eat, we've got to go to the toilet, we've got to have a shower, we've got to just do all the things, we've got to talk to people, we've got to, we just got to live an ordinary life, but all the time with our ear listening to heaven, because I'm here for a heavenly purpose. God, what is your call? What's your, you get first call on my heart, my mind, my soul, and my strength. You get first call on it. So I'll be busy using my strength to dig a garden or, or to work, but as soon as you call me, my strength is available to you first. I'll have my mind filled with my plans and my studies and all the things I'm doing. But when you want my mind, you get first call on it. I'm putting you above those other things. So I have a human existence, but my human existence is for heavenly purpose. I think that might be helpful. Let's see how that works out though in practice. And probably the best way to do that is to dive into the lives of some of the people in the Bible. And we're going to look at Job. Job chapter 1 and chapter 2 are prescribed as readings for us to start looking at. So let's have a look into the life of Job. At the beginning of the book of Job, in Job chapter 1 verse 1, we find out that there was a man in the land of Uz named Job. He was blameless and upright, fearing God. Now Job feared God and God protected him and God blessed him and he had a stack of things. Look at what he had. He had seven sons, three daughters, 7,000 sheep. Now I know some of my friends, some of you watching this program are people that have got some sheep. I'm sure you don't really want 7,000 of them. That's a bit of a handful. Job had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels. Now that's just a smelly job for you. 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and, and many servants obviously to look after all of those animals. I mean, this man was wealthy. And if you think about it in practical terms, why would you have camels? What, just to race them or something? No, he, obviously camels are used for transporting things. So, so Job ran a transport business. I mean, he had how many? 3,000 camels. You can imagine he was running a pretty impressive business of, of transporting things for people. He, he didn't need to have 3,000 camels to move things of his own. 
he was obviously in the transport business. He was moving things. If he has a 7,000 sheep, then he was obviously providing wool and he was providing meat and he was providing animals for sacrifice probably as well. He was a businessman. He had, he had really significant influence. He was the wealthiest man in his region. Don donkeys, once again, are for transporting things. Yoke of oxen, that's for plowing and cultivating ground. So, or, or maybe for pulling really heavy loads. Once again, this was a man of enterprise. He was a businessman and he was someone of quite significance, but his heart was really dedicated to God. In Job chapter one, verse three, it says here, Job was the greatest man of all the people of the East. So Job was this significant man, but the devil came and talked to God and said, Job doesn't really love you. He's pretending to love you. He gets on well with you and he, he honors you only because you're blessing him. If you strip all those things away from him, why well, his heart will become twisted and bitter and he'll be cranky with you. He'll be angry with you because his heart is not really one of putting God first. You see? And so God said, I'm going to let you um, test Job. God was confident that Job would actually come through. And so in one day, he lost all of his camels, he lost all of his sheep, he lost all of his donkeys, he, lo he lost his sons and his daughters. Tragically, I mean, I can't imagine what kind of day that was for Job. As news came, one after the other, telling him that everything had been destroyed, everything had been it just, just decimated. Uh, it must have been the most horrible time for him to have faced the loss of all the things that he, that he had, and all the things that he, he possessed. And you know, at the end of that day, as he faced that incredible pain, that incredible sense of loss, he's quoted to say in Job chapter 1, verse 21, The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Wow. How would Job have reacted if self was first? What would he have said if his life was not about putting God first, but putting himself first? If he had it, he thought his human existence was for human pleasure, human satisfaction, human importance. Well, he probably would have said something like, how dare this happen to me? It's unfair. I deserve better than this. And I hate God because he must hate me. And my happiness is the most important thing. Wow. So when we come and look practically at putting God first, it means we can enjoy all of the wonders and blessings of this life as Job did. Well, he was prosperous and blessed. He had a man of enterprise and success. He was the greatest man in the East, the Bible tells us. And so God is not against us enjoying success, being famous, being great achievers, being the top of our field, being revered and honored by people far and wide. That's not a problem with God. God's perfectly happy for us to be blessed. God blessed Job with all of those things. But Job put God first so that even when those things were stripped away from him, he still held on to that thing which came first, which was God. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, it wasn't that it was not painful. We have through the book of Job, his laments and crying out. He was in agony over these things. It wasn't as if he was spared the pain. He went through deep and tragic heart-wrenching pain in the midst of all of that, yet he put God first. The challenge for us is to be able to say, God, you have first call on my heart, mind, soul, and strength. You're first. You come first. I'm feeling great pain. I'm feeling great loss. I might even be confronting great fear. I, I might have great uncertainty, but God, you come first. I'm putting God first in my life. Now, it's interesting that in Job's circumstance, it links to his marriage because in that situation, his wife was someone who looked at his situation and said, Job, you're in a terrible state. You'd be better off dead. And the advice she gave him was, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? Now, that's significant because one of the other readings prescribed for this today's message is actually focused in the book of Mark, where the um, religious leaders came and talked to Jesus about marriage. And so here was, was, was Job in a situation where he was being challenged by his wife and she was actually contrary. She was opposing him. You'd think as a man of God, a man of great blessings and provisions, 
that um, he could have just uh, been blessed with a wonderful wife. In this instance, she was someone who did not share his commitment to God first. And even though in his heart he was ready to trust and commit himself to God in the midst of all of his pain, her attitude was, you know what, Job, I, I'd be better off if you were dead. Maybe I could get married to someone else. You know, why don't you just curse God and die? So there was something very selfish about her attitude. It wasn't supporting him. She wasn't a helpmeet to him in that situation. She was like another storm cloud beating against him in the midst of all of his misery. So let's link that into what happens in Mark chapter 10 and verse 2. I'm going to read it for you. Some Pharisees tested Jesus, asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? So here, once again, we have this direction of our attention toward marriage. How does one put God first in marriage? You see, the Pharisees in that day, so we understand, people tell us that they had all kinds of rules, uh, reasons on which you could get rid of your wife. If she burnt the meal, if she didn't obey you, if she didn't make you happy, if you weren't pleased with her, uh, if there was something that you didn't like. They had a whole bunch of rules, apparently, so I'm told. I haven't seen them written down, but that's what I've been told. And so, therefore, they, they could divorce their wife for all sorts of reasons. So they came to Jesus and said, well, Jesus, you're a bit of a religious person. You think you know what's going on. Um, what are the, the lawful reasons why a man should be able to divorce his wife? And it's interesting because this was focused on the attitude of the people. My life is about me and my life is about my happiness and God's given me a wife and she's not making me happy. So shouldn't I be allowed to get rid of her? Shouldn't I be able to? What are you saying are the rules in which I can get rid of her? Now, when that question is asked in a person, what's in their heart? Is it God first? Or is it me and my pleasure first? Well, you know, I, she looked attractive. I, was, I, I thought she'd make a lovely wife and she's displeased me. And I'm now not as happy as I want to be. I'm frustrated with this relationship. It's not delivering to me what I want. And I want to give that woman the flick. Tell me what the rules are so I can get rid of her. You see, this is not putting God first. That's right back to putting self first. It's all about me. I can recall many years ago, my mum and dad being visited by a, a woman who'd been divorced and would come to see my parents and, and she was seeking some guidance from them and I was only a youngster listening in to parts of the conversation and they must have been counselling her about uh, how to sort of behave and it wasn't suiting her and, and she said, surely God wants me to be happy. And that was her result. I remember those words thinking, wow, you know, this was her passioned desire. I, I've got to go ahead and pursue this other relationship. Surely God wants me to be happy. So in that situation, even the very statement is not about whatever God wants. He comes first, first call on my heart, mind, soul and strength. It was, I'm, I'm allowed to come first here. My happiness, surely God will put himself second so my happiness can be served. And once again, we find then that's not putting God first. It's not living for God. It's really living for self. Interesting then to see how Jesus dealt with that question. He said to them, well, what was the provision that Moses made? What rule did Moses give about divorce? And they said that and this is now picking up at Mark chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. They said, Moses permitted a man to write his wife a certificate of divorce and to send her away. But Jesus told them, Moses wrote this commandment. He wrote it for you because of your hardness of heart. Whoa. So what Jesus was saying was, Moses gave you a concession, a concession to get rid of your wife, only because he knew your heart was going to be hard. You were going to be annoyed with her. You're going to be frustrated with her. You're going to be disappointed with her. You were going to put yourself and your heart first instead of God first. And so Jesus said, the only reason you ended up with that provision in Moses' law was because your hearts actually were hard. What Jesus wanted to inspire in, the, in the, the minds of the people was a soft heart, a tender heart that would be forgiving, that would be patient, that would be tolerant, that would be able to say, God, whatever you're doing is best. The God gives and God takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So, Let's have a look at what hardness of heart might look like in the average person around us today. It's that heart that says something like this. My life is about me and my happiness. And I will not tolerate a situation that I don't want. 
And I cannot be gracious or self-sacrificing. I cannot put God's purposes above myself. Enjoyment of life is my highest value. I don't want to miss out on pleasures or my desires of happiness. Self is first. That's hardness of heart. That's not putting God first. That's not living for God. That's not loving God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. Let me go back and show you what I showed you just a moment ago about Jesus' words. Seek first the kingdom of God. The first great commandment is that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. So in the very um, ordinariness of life, the very everydayness of life, just putting up with your wife or your husband, putting up with your children, putting up with your circumstances, washing your hands, digging the garden, going to work, paying the bills. It's in this very ordinary part of life that God is meant to be first. Putting God first is something that it, we live in the world and we don't put ourselves up on some, some pillar somewhere and try and lock ourselves out of the real world. We live in the world and we face all of the things that the world gives us and in that we put God first. We put God first. We seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness and we trust God to look after all of the rest. I want you to see that really come into focus in the life of Jesus. I'm going to take you to Hebrews chapter 2. Once again, one of the readings that's been prescribed for us for this weekend. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. It says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he, that's Jesus, also shared in their humanity, that is to say, Jesus became a human, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all of their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. So we can see there that Jesus came and was born and lived for 33 years on earth because he had a divine mission. His divine mission was to defeat the enemy and to destroy the, the one that had the power of death and set people free. Jesus became human to destroy the devil and to set people free. We find that reiterated and put in different words in John's letter, the first letter of John, chapter 3 and verse 8, where John says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested or revealed that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now think about this. Jesus was sent to the earth to destroy the devil, to destroy his works, to set people free from the fear of death, to conquer sin, to open up the way for us to be right with God. That was his purpose. So did Jesus float on a cloud all of his life? Or did he get up in the morning and have to go and help with the chores? Did he have to go and feed the animals? Did he have to work with his dad in the timber yard? Did he have to help his dad and learn the trade and actually work out how to build furniture? Of course he did. That's what he had to do. It was in the very ordinariness of his life. That's actually what he was doing. But as he did those things, he knew that his purpose was for God and that at some point or other that he would hear the, the prompting of God, he would be led into that purpose. And when it was, when that moment came, he put God first in his heart, mind, soul and strength. Well, meanwhile, when his strength wasn't being called upon by God, his strength was being used to help his dad. When his mind wasn't being called upon to, to think about what God wanted him to do, he was doing his studies and, and doing the things that were normal for a, an ordinary person. He was able to put God first, even though for, for decades of his life, he actually just got about some very, very ordinary things. Human existence, I've said to you already, human existence is for heavenly purpose. God's purposes come first. Meanwhile, when God is not calling upon us to do X, Y, Z or to go and, and, and conquer something, at that point we still continue to just wait on God and to let Him be in control of what is happening, waiting for that moment when He calls us. That brings us into a situation where we are actually supernaturally natural. In fact, we are meant to be supernaturally natural and naturally supernatural. That means then that our life is living for God. We, we, we live in the power of the Spirit of God. We trust God. God lives within us. And we go about our natural life with supernatural resources around us. And then even though we are supernaturally resourced, we go around our natural life. We are naturally supernatural. It just comes natural and it's just part of who we are. And then we, we live out that supernatural life in the ordinary natural things of our existence. So Jesus came to destroy the devil. 
But what did he do for those first 30 years? What was he actually doing? His hour had not yet come. His time hadn't come. And so he was just getting about all of the ordinary things that you and I get about in our ordinary lives. Doesn't mean we're not putting God first. Jesus wasn't putting God aside when he helped his father. Or when he did chores or looked after his younger brothers and sisters for his mum, he wasn't putting God out of the picture saying, God, I'm sorry, I'm not doing anything for you. I've got to look after my younger sister. No, that was part of his life. He never at one time failed to be what God wanted him to be or do what God wanted him to do. He'd come to destroy the works of the devil, but he had to do that within the context of a very natural, ordinary life. Like the one you and I are living. So we can be living this very ordinary life, getting up in the morning, making lunch, uh, packing things off and doing things for people, whatever we're doing, talking to the neighbours over the fence, making a phone call, paying the bills. And we think, it feels like this is just a very ordinary life. Yes, that's what Jesus would be doing if he was in your shoes right now, doing all the ordinary things of life. But putting God first, first claim over our heart, mind, soul and strength. God, I'm ready to drop everything else and do what you want me to do the moment you call me. And so I'm waiting in reserve. Meanwhile, I've got to do the dishes. Meanwhile, I've got to iron the clothes. Meanwhile, I've got to walk the dog. Meanwhile, I've got to clean the bathroom. These are the things that we do while we are serving God and putting God first. It means that our heart focus is God and his purposes. It means that while we live our ordinary lives, we know that life is not about us. It's not about our happiness. It's about God. And we're ever ready to put heaven above human. Put heaven above above human, since human existence is for heavenly purpose. Human existence is for heavenly purpose. Let's go back then and look at what David said back in Psalm 26. He said, Lord, I love the house where you live, the place where your glory dwells. I lead a blameless life. Deliver me and be merciful to me. In the great congregation, I will praise you. So he was a man who got about an ordinary life, had lots of natural things to do, and yet in his heart he was longing for the presence of God, putting God first. What about Job? Everything stripped away from him, robbed of all of the things he he could have thought made him valuable. In fact, people began to despise him after that. Even the the, the lowest people would spit on him and, and would pay him no heed. He was just, had everything taken from him, and yet he could say, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He could put God first, even in the midst of his tragedy and of his pain. And so living for God is also then reflected in our marriage. And so we could say, God, I delight to do your will. I will be what you want me to be without regard for myself or my happiness or my ambitions or my hopes and dreams, trusting you to be my source of blessing, contented and joyful with happiness, peace, and provision because you are my source. See, this situation then is where we live our ordinary life. But in the midst of all of that, the very first person who has right to call upon you in any way whatsoever is God. And you listen to his voice and put him first. You respond most spontaneously to God because you you love him above all else with all, all of your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. You put God first. And yet you live a very ordinary life. Someone says, oh, I don't think there's anything special about that person. Oh, they're always at work. They're busy. They've got all these things that they've got to do. They've got a bunch of children. They've got chores. They walk the dog. They do all these things. They grow vegetables. It's just a very ordinary life. You say, yes, but that person lives their entire life committed to the fact that God, your presence is more important than anything else. You have first priority, first call. I was talking to someone just in the last couple of days who... Uh, has an elderly father who sadly has lost his sense of who he is and he's becoming a very difficult individual he's uh, not very with it very often um, often uh, in in a place of of distractness and and the 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 woman that was telling me this said you know she said I can remember my precious dad back when he was in his prime when he was really sweet and wonderful and caring and a really devoted father and the man that I now go and visit, is not like that anymore. He's not, he's not like that. He's a different person. It's like as if maybe someone else has come and lived in his body. And now there's a cranky, distracted, um, difficult individual that would be very hard to put up with. Not the wonderful father that I remember. And yet, she said, 
I look after this cranky, difficult man in honor of the man that he used to be. In honor of the fact that he was a loving and generous and caring and wonderful dad. And, and, and out of my appreciation and respect for that, I'm willing to put up with his difficulties. I'm willing to put up with his arguments and his cantankerous nature and all the problems that he creates out of honor for who he was. That's really interesting as it reflects back on what the Bible says about honor your father and your mother. You see, we would feel like, well, I could honor a person who was sweet and special and wonderful. I wouldn't honor someone who was difficult. I wouldn't honor someone who was troublemaking. I wouldn't honor someone who, who didn't really like me. You think, oh, really? Oh, really? You see, then we're saying my heart, my attitude, the way it affects me comes first. And God's instruction to honor my mother and my father, that comes second. Well, that's not putting God first, is it? When we put God first, we say, God, I entered into a marriage and it's not as happy as I want it to be, but I put you first. I will be the husband or be the wife that you called me to be for this other person, even though they are difficult, even though they are cantankerous, even though, or God, you want me to honor my mother and my father, and yet my mother has become really difficult or my father has become really difficult or, or they've never loved me or they've always told me that they, that they preferred my sibling over me and that's been very, very painful and I feel like I don't want to honor them. I feel like I want to despise them for that. When we put God first, we turn around and say, God, this is really difficult. This is really difficult, but I put you first. I will do what you want me to do. I will be who you want me to be because I'm putting you first in my life. You have the claim to my heart, my mind, my soul, and my strength. You want me to direct my heart toward my spouse, or you want me to direct my heart toward my parent. You want me to direct my heart toward these children, or to those needy people, or toward whatever it might be. You have first call. I'm putting you first. So here, I'm bringing this down to some kind of a practical level for you, so you can see that when David said his glorious things about, I want to be in your temple and I want to serve you and God, you can search me and try me. You'll find that my heart is pure. That should be true for each of us. And the way it becomes true for us, even though we are in a world full of distractions and in a world where we have to live and put up with maybe difficult people or difficult circumstances, is that our heart is first toward God. God, you know my heart is first toward you. And if you put me under test, you try me, you make life difficult, I will say the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God, I love you with all my heart, my soul, my mind and my strength. You come first. You get first call. And that might mean that my life is a life where I miss everything. Everybody else gets the big piece of cake. They get the happy marriage. They get the successful business. They get to travel the world. And I'm left here doing the dishes. God, you're first. If that's your calling for me, if that's where you've put me, if I've got to serve a cantankerous and difficult person, if that's your calling for me, then blessed be the name of the Lord. May I do it well. May I do it with your, your strength. May I do it for your glory, because it's not about me. My human existence is for heavenly purpose. And that becomes the barometer in your heart. That becomes the scale that you can use. What is your human existence for? For yourself? For your happiness? For you to prove yourself? Serve your pride? To indulge your lusts? To fill your belly? Is your human existence about you? About you proving that you're just as good as everybody else? Is your human existence about, about getting away from every possible trouble so you can have peace and quiet? Is your life about, about you being able to have the quiet, happy journey down the peaceful river of life? Or is your life about saying, God, you planted me here. What am I here for? How can I be what you want me to be and do what you want me to do? Because I'm putting God first. You have first call on my heart, my mind, my soul, and my strength. What do you want from them? If you've got no call on them, I want to use the strength to build a business. I want to devote my heart toward this and I want to be able to use my mind to think about that. But as soon as you want me, I'm ready to divert my attention directly to you and to your purposes. I can do all the ordinary things of life and just be looking very natural, but I will be supernaturally natural. And even though I'm connected to the living God, I'll be naturally supernatural. 
I'll just go through this life full of the power of God with God first in my life, whether I'm changing nappies or doing dishes or doing washing someone's car or whatever else those other things might be, because God comes first. And if that means I serve and do the chores that no one else wants to do, then blessed be the name of the Lord. If that means that everyone around me comes and toots the horn of the new car while I can't even get my old bum started, then blessed be the name of the Lord. When I put my money to things and they all go wrong and someone else ends up just getting a million dollars for, for just pure luck, then blessed be the name of the Lord. My life is not about me and about me looking good or me having all the trinkets of this world. My life is about putting God first. <laughs> Am I coming through? Uh, our human existence is for heavenly purpose. That's what we're here for. And you have God's call upon your life. You are here for heavenly purpose. Put God first and let that call of God, whatever it is for you in your circumstances, put God first. Honor what he wants you to do and trust him. He will bless you. He will open up the doors. He'll open up the windows of heaven for you. He will navigate you through. He'll give you contentment and joy in the most difficult circumstances. You can trust the Lord. So put him first. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would change our heart so that we too would live for you and for your kingdom, for your presence, for your will to be done, for your purposes to be fulfilled in us and our family, and for your glory to be seen in all of the earth. Hallelujah. Lord, we want to put you first. So take a control of our lives, work your work of your spirit in each one of us so that we might humbly say, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We trust you. And we ask that you be glorified in and through each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, friends.